everybody. Hi. Hello, everybody. My name is Gwenda Shankalepore. I am a cloud solution architect from Microsoft, specializing on data and AI, and focusing mainly on AI. And today, I'm going to speak about, my talk will be about, what if AI was your daughter? But before answering this question, I need to tell you a few things about me. First of all, uh, my passion for technology started a long time ago, when I was very young. And I think we can make accountable a uh, few people for that. And the first two people are the two people in this picture, which are my parents. The person on the left is my dad, and he's the one that, when I was four years old, put me in front of a computer. The one on the left side of the picture is my mother, and she's the one who tried to take me away because I was spending too much time on the computer. And then I think you all know this man. <laughs> so he is Bill Gates. And when I was very little, I was watching the news with my parents, and he was getting, an in he was getting interviewed. And the journalist asked him, why are you in the technology field? Why did you choose to do that? And he said, I'm doing this because I think technology can make other people's life easier. And I don't know, it got me. And I look at my father and I told him, OK, I want to work for that man. And my father is an entrepreneur, so he was not that happy about this decision. And until then, I always said that I wanted to be a vet, a painter, or sell ice cream because I'm from Italy. So he uh, was not that into it. But uh, when I told them what I wanted to do, they helped me understanding what was the path to go and work for Microsoft. And the first thing they told me was that I had to study scientific matters, so whatever was about math, physics, biology, and all that stuff. And especially that when, I, when, when uh, the time for university came, I had to study something like computer science or engineering, because I needed to uh, learn how to communicate with a computer or how to program a computer. And so while uh, I was studying, I chose as my, uh, my high school uh, scientific matters. And then when I graduated from there, uh, all my classmates were looking for where to go, and I was very sure where I want to go. So I, um, I registered to the University of Milan, and I started studying computer science. And while I, while I was there, I, I started uh, a course that was called Computer Human Interaction. Probably some of you are familiar with it. And uh, my professor was very good, and I did my thesis with him, my bachelor thesis with him, and I was amazed about how many things you can do, uh, and how, how can you basically transform a computer and make it work like a brain. And so when I had to decide what to do after my bachelor, I decided to change a little bit, and I went to do my master in cognitive neuroscience. So studying how the brain works, because I wanted to understand better how we work and how to make a computer look like a brain as much as possible. So that's where I started learning about machine learning and AI. Um, the last thing I need to tell you about me is that I'm an aunt. Uh, I have two brothers, an uh, older sister, and uh, my brother is in the middle. I'm the youngest one in the family. Well, now not anymore. Uh, but my brother got this um, beautiful daughter two years ago. And basically, she's now, I don't know, she's bossing everybody around because you know how kids can be. And I'm telling you that because as far from, like, before my, my, my niece was born, Basically, in the family, I was the one that people bought presents for, you know? And uh, my sister and my brother, we all have this kind of competition on which one of us is the best in getting the best presents, so it's the best brother or the best sisters in the family. And so last year, in this exact period, there was a dilemma for me. And it was that Christmas was coming, and it was the first Christmas in which my niece would be awake until midnight, waiting for Santa to come with the presents. And I know she was just one year and a half uh, old, so she wouldn't remember anything in the years after. But you know, there are camera photos, so you can always remember her, how you can become the, her favorite aunt. And so I just had one goal, which was, what should I buy her? And I never actually bought something for someone younger than me, because I was the youngest in the family. So it was the first time for me to go shopping for a kid. And I have to tell you, I learned um, a lot of things. And as you can imagine, because the period is exactly the same, um, it was Christmas time. 
So every mall and every uh, shop inside the city, I'm from Milan, was all Christmas-related. People were around going, crowding the malls because everybody was uh, find, looking for some perfect present and stuff like that. And people were all there singing Christmas carols and everything and stopping you and saying, oh, Merry Christmas, why don't you come here and shop? And you're like, no, please, let me go. And you're trying to get uh, to, the, to the shop that you want to actually go. And so, uh, if you ever enter a toy shop, you probably notice a few things. First of all, that they all look alike, actually. And they usually have, in the front, these cashiers. And then behind the cashiers, there is this huge space divided in two. A blue area and then a pink area, you know? And you're like looking around and you think, I'm gonna get, how can I get a present inside here? And sometimes when you get inside, you get lost, so if you need to spend a few times there, you maybe need to warn someone in the family that you're going inside the shop so that they know and they can come look for you if you don't get back in time. Um, but so it was this huge place and I didn't know where to start. And the few things I knew were that my niece loves to dance. Every time she hears a song, she starts dancing. And uh, that she's very curious, of course, because of her age. So uh, everything new or everything creative, actually, she loves it a lot. And so I had these two things in mind, something that was noisy in some ways, uh, that, could, that she would for sure love and their parents maybe less love, <laughs> and um, something that uh, could uh, actually help her get more creative. And so I need you to imagine me inside this shop, surrounded by thousands of, of toys, and each and every of them was different in some ways. There were uh, brooms, um, um, teapots, uh, washing machine, microscope, telescope, robots, uh, cars, dolls, whatever you can imagine. And I was just going around without knowing what to do. So I asked actually the help for uh, an employee there and asked him, hey, hi, <laughs> sorry, can you please help me looking for uh, a toy that is for my niece? And he was just pointing to me for the pink area of the shop. And so I, I, got, I got really frustrated about it. And then I remember, I told you a few things about me. I studied computer science, and then I studied cognitive neuroscience. And i kind of in the middle from a developer and a data scientist. And so I thought, why don't I use data that I have to find the perfect toy for my niece? Because I will have all the, the catalog, the toys catalog, and I can take that information, and I know what I'm looking for, something uh, noisy and creative, right? OK, so. Let me be more a cloud solution architect than, <laughs> um, than a data scientist. So the machine learning process works in this way. You need to have a very sharp question, so something you really want to solve. And in my case, it was simple. I want to find the perfect toy, right? And then the second thing you need is you need to have data, lots of data. And I had them because it was Christmas time, and everybody, when you were passing in front of their shops, they are giving you this uh, paper catalog. And some of them, they, they also have the online version, luckily for me. Um, and so you need some data that you need to pre-process, because usually the data that surrounds us is not perfect for machine learning or for solving your problem. So you need to take a look in the data that you have and understanding if it might actually help you um, solving your problem. And looking at the catalog, it, it, I thought that it was uh, enough comprehensive of what I was looking for. And then what you need is usually to find a model to, that will take uh, your data as input and will give you the answer that you are looking for. And for that, I use the Microsoft service that is called Cognitive Services. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but basically they are just uh, REST APIs, so endpoints that you can call uh, that actually solve a very specific problem for you. So the problems are divided in categories. The categories are the five categories you see here and are problems related to images, videos, or uh, pictures uh, about speech. And it's what I'm using for my, uh, for my subtitles. Uh, search, so whatever a, an, a search engine can do. Language to understand the written language. 
And then there is a new category that is called decision, which allows you to make an uh, even better decision. And each of these five categories allows you to use um, these APIs and gives you also the possibility to use some custom API, so something in which you don't just trust Microsoft about um, taking some data in and getting your output, but you want to train on top of Microsoft knowledge, on top of Microsoft algorithms, something very specific to the data that you own and that you have. And in this case, for me, I had a problem that was related to vision, of course, and I wanted to use toy catalogs, which I don't think it's a Microsoft priority right now. So what I did is using uh, custom vision. Did any of you ever try it? OK. Uh, so custom vision, basically, what it does is taking a picture as an input, and it trains the model, the machine learning model, on the picture that you gave it to him, that you gave to him. Uh, so in this case, what I did was my pre-processing part was uh, cropping all the images from the catalog. That's why I said that I was lucky that some of them were online. <laughs> uh, cropping the images, taking these images as an input, and then Custom Vision learned to recognize the toys from boys and girls, and I try also to create a model that was able to categorize the toys as creative and non-creative. And believe me, this category, I didn't invent them. They were in the catalog, actually. The catalog was divided, and there were some tags inside uh, down on the picture of the toys, so it was easy for me to do that. And I'm going to show you how it works. OK, so if I, this is the portal of Custom Vision. OK. And if you sign in, you need to have a Microsoft account. If you have it linked to an Azure subscription, it's easier because it's going to take the key from there. And as you see, this is the portal. And what the portal actually allows you to do is create a project. If I do create a new project, I can put a name here. And I can call it, I don't know, um, Toys Demo. Uh, he asked me a description, but you can also not put it. He asked me for a key, and I already have mine. And as you can see, it has uh, two categories. One is classification, and the other one is object detection. So you can choose what you want to do on the data that you gave to the algorithm. So the first one, classify something inside the image. And it may be, and uh, if you look at the classification type, that is the uh, what is written suddenly down after. Um, the classification can be multi-label, so if you need to categorize many things inside the same picture, or if you just need one thing in one picture, OK? Uh, the other way that you can do it is an object detection. So object detection is when you want to find something inside a picture. I don't know, uh, a specific kind of purse, uh, a specific model of car, uh, um, a dog inside the picture, stuff like this. If you want to find it, or your logo, maybe you have your picture of your logos and you want to see how it is used and where, you can use this kind of, uh, this kind of service. So. I'm going to do a classification because I want just to classify uh, girl toys versus boy toys. And then I want to see created toys versus not creative toys. So I create my project. And it's really easy. If I do here add images, and now I need to see, OK. Um, and I go here, I have a few of the pictures that I cropped. And I can select them all, say open, and tag them as girl. And say upload. And he actually now is learning from the picture that I'm giving to him that these are good toys. And then if I add the pictures, I have also some boy toys that I cropped from the catalogs. And in this case, I add my boy tag, and I do upload. And as you can see, I didn't give the, give the service many pictures. It's just 10 and 9 from one category to another. So it's really few pictures, few images. And it's pretty easy. I now go and click here, train, because that's the next step. So once you find the algorithm that you want to use, once you have your data, the next thing you usually do, you take this algorithm and you train it on the data that you have. And I'm going to click train. It's going to ask me if I want to do an advanced train or a quick train. A quick train is easier for this demo purpose. 
And while it's thinking, what it's going to show to me is the performance of the algorithm on the data that I give you. Of course, this is probably overfitting because I give him few images, but it's actually pretty accurate if you think about uh, how few pictures I gave it to him. So let's try to test it because, of course, I wanted to use it to find the perfect toy. So I need to be sure that it actually learned what is a boy toy versus a girl toy, right? So there is a small quick test button here, and I can try to give him a uh, picture that I did not give him uh, for training, like, for example, this car. And if you see here, it gives me the tag as girl. So it seems it's working. Let's see if he actually is able also to find a toy that I know is for boys. Given this other picture. I load it, and as you can see, it targeted with 100% of certainty. So it actually seems to work. And you can think about machine learning exactly as a child that is learning from you or for what uh, our parents or the experience that he has are teaching him, OK? Exactly like that, you can create a machine learning algorithm, and you can uh, train him to do something for you. So I'm going to get back to my presentation. So after training the algorithm, what I wanted to do was evaluate if the model was working. And now I showed you just uh, the boys versus girl algorithm. But I created also the one created versus no creative toys. And what I found out was really interesting, actually. First of all, the model learned to categorize bo toys for, bo for boys and girls. He also learned that. Boy, the boy toys were blue and girl toys were pink. The other thing that he learned was that he was able to categorize creative toys versus not creative toys. But the funny thing was that none of the toys that he categorized as girl toys were actually creative toys. And the other thing that from the data set and the model uh, and I, learned that scientific toys, microscope, telescope, and whatever, were not meant for girls. So I know what you're thinking now. <laughs> what are you saying, actually? That girls can be creative? That girls can love other colors other than pink? And that girls cannot be scientists? Well, I know you're thinking that we are far better than this. Right? It's the algorithm, it's the machine that is not perfect, even though we are used to think that machines are better than us because they don't have biases, right? Well, I have to disagree with that, and I'm going to show you why. And I'm going to start with uh, a video. I don't know how many of you knows it, know it, but uh, I'm going to show you something. Bullying the Me Too the movement against sexual toxic harassment. Masculinity. Is this the best a man can get? Is it? We can't hide from it. Sexual harassment is taking over. It's been going on far too long. We can't laugh it off. Who's the daddy? What I actually think she's trying to say. Making the same old excuses. Boys will be boys. Boys will be boys. Boys will be boys. But something finally changed. Allegations regarding sexual assault and sexual harassment. Once, but she says he's a prostitute. And there will be no going back. Because we, we believe in the best in men. Men need to hold other men accountable. Smile, sweetie. Come on. To say the right thing. To act the right uh, way. Bro, not cool, not cool. Some already are. In ways big. Yo, men, for everyone. And small. I am strong. I am strong. But some is not enough. It's not how we treat each other, okay? Okay. Because the boys watching today.
So I don't know how many of you knew this spot, but Gillette uh, let it out uh, a few years ago. And you know the reaction to this? The men started to riot against it because they said it was colliding with the Me Too movement, that it was not manly to say this thing, that they would not and ever buy again a Gillette razor. So are we really better than that? And if you still don't believe me, I got another example. And this one is about Italy. You probably don't understand what is written there, but I'm going to translate it for you. And he says that basically the economy in Italy is going down, but gays are going up. So first, which is the correlation between the two things? But then he's also discriminating the other categories, where are the lesbian, the transgender, and the other communities. And still, this is my favorite one, actually. Do you know Barbie, right? The doll. Well, two years ago, in the US, they published this beautiful book that is called Barbie, Can I Be a Software Engineer? And in this book, uh, in was, it, it had many episodes, but the, my favorite one is this one, in which in the comic it said, um, there is somebody talking to Barbie and asking him, oh, Barbie, uh, the robot uh, puppy that you draw is beautiful. Can I play with it and play with your game, the game that you are developing? And she said, I'm only creating the design ideas. I need Steven and Brian to help for the real game. So, first of all, who the hell are Steven and Brian? And second of all, at the answer of the question that was, hey, Barbie, can I be a software engineer? Probably should be. Ask Stephen and Brian, right? So are we really better than this? No. We all have something that is called unconscious bias. And unconscious bias is something that is deep, radicated inside your brain. And even if you think you are the most open person in the world, you're still going to have some stereotypes inside your head that society or the experience that you have put inside your head. So when we talk about unconscious bias, we are talking about these stereotypes that are learned automatically, unintentionally. You usually are not aware of them. So it's important to know that they are there because you have them. And there is a person that wrote this book that is called Biased, which is Jennifer Eber Hart. And she said that implicit, implicit bias is not a way of calling someone a racist. In fact, you don't have to be a racist at all to be influenced by it. Implicit bias is a kind of distorting lens that's a product, the product of both the architecture of our brain and the disparity in society. And it's, it, this is really true. So, even though you think you may not be racist or homophobic or you're not discriminating anybody, probably society taught you something about it. For example, I'm the first person to think that women in technology is not a very easy association. And believe me, I'm experimenting on my skin because since I decided to study scientific, mire, uh, scientific matters, it has not been like a very, an easy-peasy path, honestly because I was often the only girl in the class. And everybody sometimes were complaining about me because if I got a higher grade, it was just because I was a female girl and not because I married it. And believe me that probably the, the few girls that are in this room that I can see probably have experienced the same. And this is it's not just about gender or sexual orientation, it's about anything, uh, your religions, uh, the, the political way that you see things. So it can include many, many things. Things that probably you don't even consider when you're thinking or talking with somebody. There is, if you still don't believe me, there is a test that is called the Implicit Test Association. Uh, that, is, uh, that has been built by Stanford University a few years back. And it's a very simple test. If you want to take it, if you look, it for, uh, if you look for it online, you can find it. And basically what it does is shows you some categories. In this case, I chose uh, male, female versus scientific matter and literature matters. And what it shows you in the top corner, it shows you the category, the two of them, so male or science. 
and the other side is female or liberal arts. And then in the middle, it shows you some words that are related with one of the category that you need to basically choose in which of the category has to go the word, okay? And if you try it, in the first, uh, in the first screen in which male is associated with the category science and female is associated with the category liberal arts, you're gonna see, you're gonna be very quick in answering uh, the, the, the test and you're gonna be very good in associating one or the other category. But if we switch the association, the category, so if I do male with liberal arts and female with science, when the words are gonna uh, come up to the screen, you're gonna take more time in answering, and that's implicit bias, because you need to think about it, because your brain association is the first one, not the second one, and you need to think about it to get out from the bias. So, what if I was your daughter? Would you think about it when you create a machine learning algorithm about the differences that can be in the world, the different way we see the world, the different ways we are in the world? Because would you like if, an algorithm, if a machine learning algorithm would decide your job, your payment, or I don't know, if you can stay here or you have to go away, um, based on some people that didn't think about your orientation, your gender, your religion, the color, of your, uh, the, the color of your skin. Would you really like to be so naive to take an algorithm as I did and just trust someone else that categorized the toys and let him decide for me what my niece has to play with? So only non-creative, non-scientific pink toys? Or do you want that your children, your nephew, your neighbor, or the people sitting next to you is able to do whatever he wants in the respect, of course, of the people that are next to him? In Microsoft, we believe in responsible AI. And I think that if you think about Spider-Man when he said that from uh, great power comes great responsibility, this is the, key, the case. AI is a tool. How you use this tool is uh, on you. And it's a tool that learns from things that you give to him. He learns from the data that you give to him. He learns from the input that you label. And if you label them discriminating someone, consciously or unconsciously, it may be an arm for someone else. So you need to think about it. So I wanted to conclude with a, a quote from Satya. Uh, it was being interviewed a uh, few months ago. And the, the interviewer asked him why you are so focused on AI and diversity and inclusion inside your company. Why do you think diversity and inclusion are so important? And he said, it's not just for having a representation, it's how the culture of your organization is going to help people who come from diverse background to do their very best work. And it means that it doesn't matter where you come from, what your history is, uh, what, what are your beliefs? You need to sit next to the, the another person that maybe has beliefs completely opposite of yours, but it can widen your uh, view on things, even if you don't agree with them. Because diversity and inclusion doesn't mean that you have to agree with everything. If, something you're not, if you don't believe in something, you don't have to. But you need to respect the, the other people that actually believe in that. So, before we say goodbye, I found the perfect toy. And as I told you, I wanted something creative, something that was related to music, something noisy in some ways, and that she would remember it, and her parents too. So, this was a Sunday morning. So thank you very much everybody.